Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Felicia Jean, President of the Board of Directors of CHAPA and Vice President of Maloney Development. I am pleased to welcome everyone to CHAPA's John. I am pleased to welcome everyone to CHAPA's Tools and Strategies for Increasing Housing Production Conference. Like you, I look forward to CHAPA trainings for a few reasons the breadth and depth of the speakers, the range of topics covered, and the resources that we all take back to our communities. CHAPA has reached across the state to bring together an amazing group of speakers you will meet today and over the next two weeks who will share information and their experience using various tools for producing the homes we need. Today is about the nuts and bolts of 40B and the local initiative program. Next week, we will learn about strategies for building support for affordable homes and connecting housing production to advancing community goals around sustainability, inclusion, affordability, and economic development. We will wrap up the conference with a session on the new MBTA Communities Multifamily Zoning Implementation and tools available to help communities put zoning in place for the homes people need. COVID has reminded us that we have so much work to do in meeting our goals, and now is the time to dive in. We are motivated and we have resources that will put us on a path to equity, resilience, sustainability through our housing policies. We're gonna to start today with our most fundamental tool, 40B. Our three presenters will touch on both basic and topical aspects of the law. Professor Ed Marchand will provide an overview of 40B. Phil DiMartino of DHCD, who will update us on the safe harbors and the use census data. Attorney Paul Haverty of Blattman, Bobrowski, Haverty, and Silverstein will present a summary of a very recent and very important case before the SJC impacting barriers to housing production. The second part of today's session is a conversation guided by Rieka Hayashi and Ali Sabatino of DHCD with their fellow panelists, Clay Williams of Eastland Properties and Amanda Shankola of the City of Salem on their successes with local action units and best practices using this approach to housing production. I wish I had the time to share the extensive backgrounds of all our panelists. We will provide a link to all of the panelists' bios. It is a full agenda today, and our panelists have graciously agreed to stay until 4.45, so we will have time for Q&A. I want to mention a few housekeeping items. As you saw in the beginning, we are recording this webinar. Please use the Q&A for all content questions. Feel free to post questions during the presentation. Panelists will respond to as many questions as possible during or after the presentations. Please use the chat only for technical questions. Closed captioning is available for this webinar. Please check your toolbar to activate this feature. One of the things that we all love about conferences like this is that we have the opportunity to network. While we can't do this in normal fashion this year, we look forward to seeing you in person next month and through hybrid trainings and conferences in the future. And with that, I will turn the screen over to Ed Marchand. Thanks, Felicia. Uh, I need to correct one thing you said, although I love being called a professor. I'm a few steps ahead of a good TA. I'm a lecturer <laughs> and a practitioner, but thank you. Uh, today, I'm going to be talking about 40B basics. I've been working on 40B projects for many years. I've worked on probably almost uh, 200 projects, uh, either advising ZBAs or advising developers. Today, I work primarily uh, advising developers. Um, I, I usually don't use sports analogies in my teaching, uh, but I think it works uh, for this particular presentation. And I hope it works out better than the Red Sox season has to date. So let's begin. We're on deck. Uh, we have to see sort of prepare to get up to bat. And in order to get up to bat, whether you're a community who's interested in sort of doing a 40B project because public agencies can do 40Bs or a developer, you need to know whether or not you're eligible to do a 40B. So there are three statutory uh, minima that you need to be aware of. I'm gonna go over them very briefly because Phil DiMartino 
uh, is an expert in this, and he's going to be discussing uh, the statutory minima and the safe harbors. The one we all know is the 10% number. Does a community have at least 10% of its year-round housing units as units that would qualify for listing and are listed on DHCD subsidizing, subsidized housing inventory? That's easy. And it's easy for both communities and for developers to track that. DHCD publishes the subsidized housing inventory. And uh, be, because that's out of date the day it issues it, um, as a developer or as a community, you have to get updates to see if any units have been added or if any units have been dropped from the subsidized housing inventory. The next statutory minima is the one and a half percent general land area. And that, unlike the 10%, is very difficult to track. And it usually gets tracked only when a town claims it as a safe harbor, the applicant appeals, and then a detailed analysis is done. Uh, and we'll talk about that a little bit later, and Phil might cover some of that. The next one is hardly worth talking about. And all the, all the work I've done in 40B, I've never seen it, but it really talks about if more than three tenths of 1% of the land area in a community or 10 acres, whichever is greater, uh, has ongoing construction of qualified affordable housing. So that's the first thing I look at. And it's the first due diligence anyone should do uh, if they're contemplating uh, doing a 40B project. Uh, then there are the safe harbors. And the safe harbors actually were created by DHCD to create incentives for municipalities to uh, prepare a housing production plan and sort of meet the criteria in that housing production plan. Again, Phil's going to talk more about this, but I think they're relatively sort of simple goals to meet one half of 1% of your, of the year round housing units. Uh, if you can do that and get those units certified, you have a one year period during which you can deny any comprehensive permit. If you are able to create 1% of your year round units, you would get a two year safe harbor. One thing's important to note about safe harbors and the statutory minima, they do not prevent a ZBA from approving a project. Many towns or several towns have met their 10% standard and find 40B to be the most expeditious way to get a project approved. One good example of that is Cambridge. Uh, Cambridge has a fairly complex sort of city government, and they, they have clearly exceeded 10%, but they continue use, to use 40B to get affordable housing built. If you don't have a housing production plan, you would have to create 2% of the year round housing units and get only a one year safe harbor period. Clearly that's designed to incentivize communities to prepare a housing production plan. Uh, finally, there's a large project definition. Uh, DHCD has placed limits in terms of the maximum size of a project based upon the number of year round housing units. Uh, you can see from my chart here, if there are less than 2,500 units, year round units, uh, the maximum size of the project is 6% of those year round units. And obviously, as the number of year-round year units increase, the total number of units increase, 200 to 250. And if you have more than 7,500 year-round housing units in your community, the maximum size is the greater of 300 units or 2% of the year-round units. So um, Phil will provide more details on that. And there's also sort of the, the spite uh, safe harbor related applications. 
Sometimes it's called a spite or sometimes it's called the cooling off period. Um, if a developer feels that he or she has not made much progress in getting a uh, project approved by a planning board, they might say, well, we tried to work with you, uh, didn't work and says, uh, we're gonna do a 40B. Well, you can't, you, you've got to have a 12 month cooling off period uh, between certain sort of events that are associated with that prior application. If that prior application had at least 10% affordable units in it, uh, the 12 month cooling off period uh, is not in effect. So we're on the on deck circle. We, we, we see that there are no safe harbors or statutory minimum that are satisfied. So what's first base? First base is getting a PEL. A PEL is a project eligibility letter. And historically, it used to be very easy to get them. You could go to a bank under the NEF program and the bank would give you a letter. Well, that didn't work out well because the screening on that uh, was not as diligent as it should have been. Now you have to get your project eligibility letter from one of the state housing agencies. And the assumption is they have the expertise to review your proposed project. And there are four sort of eight agencies you can go to. I tried to list these in alphabetical order, Department of Housing and Community Development. And in particular, you'd go to them for a LIP, Local Initiative Program. Uh, Rieko Hayashi, whom you'll be hearing from, is the director of that program. Uh, or you might go, I recently worked on a project where they're uh, anticipating doing a low-income housing tax credit project. And they went to DHCD for their 40B project eligibility letter. You would go to mass development primarily if you wanted to do a, a 4% low income housing tax credit project because you have to have tax exempt bonds to get a 4% tax credit allocation. There are only two agencies that issue tax exempt bonds for housing. That's mass development or mass housing. Uh, at Mass Housing, they have a number of programs you could work with. You can get 4% tax credits uh, through Mass Housing um, because, as I said, they issue tax exempt bonds. They also have their own funding programs or they work with the New England Fund. And many developers do get project eligibility through the New England Fund program. And finally, there's Mass Housing Partnership. Mass Housing Partnership uh, works on uh, rental developments and uh, Mass Housing Partnership has its own funding resources, but to expand the availability of capital for housing, they also participate with other uh, lenders. The Pell application uh, is what you would expect it to be. You need to sort of say who you are, um, including the members of the development team, what you intend to build, what your experience was. You have to submit a pro forma for the application um, and provide other information on the project, uh, in particular, uh, engineering preliminary preliminary engineering uh, plans and uh, preliminary architectural plans. Uh, you'll be hearing from Clayton Williams um, later on. And very often developers will want to meet with neighbors or some of the public officials, either electeds or staff persons. Uh, to get some feedback on their proposed project. The subsidizing agencies uh, either require or strongly suggest that you meet with them before 
doing a lot of work on your PEL uh, in case there's something that they can immediately say, hey, that's not going to fly with us. Don't waste your time doing that. Here's what we think the, the parameters of a project that we would likely be able to approve might be. Uh, in 40B, there are some threshold requirements. You get sort of very beneficial public benefits in terms of zoning exceptions, as they're called formally. Most of us would refer to them as waivers. In return for that, you do have to provide affordable housing. That's what it's about. At least 25% of the units that would be affordable to households at 80% of area median income or 20% of the units affordable at 50% of area median income. That requirement applies to both rental and to home ownership projects. The differentiation is, <clears throat> and towns are very aware of this, that in a rental project, if you meet those, or when you meet, not if, when you meet those affordability requirements on a rental project, all of the units will count towards the subsidized housing inventory. So a hundred unit project with 25 affordable units, you get credit for a hundred units on your subsidizing housing inventory. If it were a ownership project, you would get credit only for the 25 affordable units. The Pell, in order to get a Pell, the Subsidizing agency has to make certain fun findings. I'm gonna just run through them quickly. Your proposal has to be consistent with subsidy program requirements. The site has to be appropriate for residential use. The design has to be appropriate. Project has to be financially feasible and consistent with the limited uh, distribution requirements in 40B which is 10% if it's a 10% return, maximum return of 10% on equity, if it's a rental project and a maximum development fee of 20% of approved costs, if it's a for sale project. You must have site control and you must be an eligible sponsor, a public agency, a not-for-profit or a limited dividend entity. You become a limited dividend entity simply by stating that you will enter into a regulatory agreement which limits your dividend. So we're, we got to first base, we got the Pell, that's the ticket that allows us to get to second base. Second base is the preparation and submission of a comprehensive permit application. There is not a significant amount of additional work to prepare the comprehensive permit application. Uh, you probably will do, based upon feedback you received during the Pell process, um, you would refine your engineering plans, maybe your architectural plans also. You might do a traffic study as uh, part of your comprehensive permit application. Smart developers, if they know there's a particularly outstanding or sensitive issue, will do more work on that. If storm drainage is a particular issue, you're gonna do some soil testing. And uh, again, de developers' primary asset is their time. They don't want to waste your time, their time, their money, pursuing a project that doesn't make sense. If you're working on a site that doesn't have public sewer, you're certainly going to confirm that the soils are suitable for a septic field. You might do a more detailed uh, waiver list. Um, one of the things I forgot to mention as part of the Pell is after it's submitted and the subsidizing agency confirms that it's a complete application, they will send to the town what's known as a 30-day comment letter. That gives the town uh, an opportunity to comment on the proposed project. Uh, 
I've highlighted and read the critical schedule timing of events. And this is my Reader's Digest version of a 40B overview. I have a longer version, which Carol has or has been posted. As I had mentioned, that will give details on each of these sort of timing steps. I'm just gonna give you a quick description of what they are. Assume that uh, day zero is the day that the application is submitted to the clerk's office. The town has seven days to distribute copies of the application to all town boards and local committees. Uh, and it needs to advertise the public hearing at least 14 days in advance of the public hearing. And remember, you must, you've got to be very careful about scheduling that initial public hearing within 30 days of receipt of the application. Uh, you have 15 days uh, from the opening of the initial hearing to uh, state that you have achieved a safe harbor. The developer has 15 days to appeal that. DHCD has 30 days to review the competing claims. And the developer has 20 days to appeal DHCD's finding if it confirms, if it disagrees with DHCD's finding. 180, 180 days is the maximum term of the, that the ZBA can hold a public hearing open. Uh, very often based upon the changes in the project or need for additional materials, the ZBA will ask for extensions of that time period uh, from the developer. Uh, once the hearing is closed, the ZBA has 40 days to issue a decision, and then there's a 20 day appeal period. Again, there is a formal sort of schedule uh, that is important to both ZBAs and developers. Uh, the public hearing is, is open. The initial hearing can be continued uh, multiple times during that 100 day, 180 day period. Primary purpose of the ZBA, and it's a very difficult job, uh, is to balance regional housing need with local concerns. The local concerns are health, safety, environmental, design, open space, planning, or other local concerns. And then they issue a decision. The decision is either approve or submit, it never happens, deny it, shouldn't happen, or approve with conditions. The reason I say it shouldn't, ZBAs normally don't deny a permit outright is that it puts it in a disadvantage, uh, more disadvantaged uh, position if the developer appeals to the HAC. Uh, the developer can appeal to the HAC, neighbors appeal to the Superior Court or Land Court. So let's get to third base. We got the comprehensive permit. There was no appeal. And a good sort of project is one where you can get your comprehensive permit and not have it appealed. Unfortunately, um, there is still a huge component of nimbyism uh, here and every place else. Uh, so appeals are not uncommon. Paul Haverty is gonna be talking to us shortly about a very interesting case and he'll explain uh, what's happening in terms of what may happen in terms of appeals. Uh, so once we get that comprehensive permit, and very often there are changes that occur during the hearing, uh, improve, usually resulting in improvements to the project, uh, the developer, I'm already out of town, but I'll, time, but I'll finish this off. The project, uh, the developer has to get final approval Final approval is a process where the subsidizing agencies review the revisions in the project and determine whether or not they can make the same findings that they had to make for the Pell. And sort of the, the, the ticket you get, and this time the ticket is a ticket to proceed and build the project, uh, is the regulatory agreement. 
Uh, the execution of the regulatory agreement is really the indication that you have received final approval. The toughest parts of getting uh, final approval, you have to submit a written financial commitment. In the PEL, it's a sort of a courtesy letter from a lender, N not a real deal. Uh, but you have to submit the real financial commitment and you have to submit and have approved an affirmative fair housing marketing plan. Uh, those are done by experts uh, who keep up with all of the nuances of affirmative fair housing marketing plans and the lottery rules uh, here, uh, both state and uh, federal. Uh, finally, we get to home. Oh, we're, 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 we're running from third base to home. Uh, we've, we have to finalize the engineering plans and architectural plans. We, we have to have a construction loan closing and execute that um, construction loan, uh, construction contract prior to the closing. Uh, the lottery, uh, depending upon whether it's a rental or for sale project, you have to work out the timing on that as to how early you want to begin. You rent up or sell your, your product and you then complete construction, get a certificate of occupancy. And again, at this point, there's not much difference between a 40B project and a conventional um, project. One of the differences, of course, because you're getting a public benefit, you have to certify your costs that's used as the basis upon which your limited dividend distribution is based. That uh, is my conclusion. I realize that that was very quick, but if you have an interest or a need in uh, learning this in greater detail, I suggest you take a look at my more detailed overview. Thanks everybody. I'd like to introduce Phil DiMartino now. Thanks, Ed. And I think Chap is going to be putting up my uh, presentation momently, momentarily. Okay, I'm gonna start off, as Ed mentioned, he hit on some of the safe harbors, but I'll be going into greater detail and give, a, give you a census update as well. Oh, it's, okay, thanks for the, this little trouble advancing the, the screens, but I think it's working now. Um, probably the best known safe harbor is the 10%. Um, these are the three statutory safe harbors, meaning they date back to 1969 when the law uh, was enacted. So the first one, the 10%, one thing to note is you can't just be at 10%, you have to exceed 10%. Uh, there was a case in Canton, I think about eight years ago, they were just at 10%, the developer challenged it. The HAC found out, uh, decided that basically you've got to exceed 10%, so you should be at 10.1%. General land area minimum also uh, referred to as GLAM. We didn't have a lot of activity with this at all until about 2014 when Stoneham invoked it. Since then, it's been pretty busy. Uh, sites of SHI eligible units prorated for partial sites comprising um, equal to or greater than 1.5% of total land area zone for residential, commercial, and industrial use. So I've got a couple slides on that coming up. Annual land area minimum, as, as Ed mentioned, we've never had this invoked. There's no regulations or guidelines. This, this is an excerpt from the statute. I think it would have to be a very big 40B in a very small community. Uh, a pro so a developer would either, you know, come in with a much smaller project, or if they did come, on, come in with something that would trigger the safe harbor, uh, they'd probably get caught up in the large scale project safe harbor. <clears throat> So the 10%, just wanna talk about this a bit. As Ed mentioned, um, 
we generally count under 40B 100% of the rental uh, rental projects. So the vast majority of 40Bs are rentals. If you're doing 25% at 80% AMI, you get 100% count. If you're doing 20% at 50% AMI, so lower level of units, higher level of affordability, you also get 100% count. For ownership units, it's only the deed restricted units that count. So if you're doing a 100 unit ownership project, you'd get you know 20 to 25 units on the SHI. So there's a real incentive to develop affordable housing, um, you know, develop rental housing because frankly, it's it's the quickest way to, to get your count up. Uh, the formula for the 10% is based on uh, the Seminole US Census numbers. Baseline numbers will be re readjusted post 2020 census. And I'll be getting into some census information now. Uh, but if you do look at who's at 10%, it tends to be all the gateway cities, places like Worcester, Fitchburg, Springfield, because I know when we talk about 40B SHI, people sometimes just think it's, it's only 40B units that count towards your affordable component, but federal and rental um, housing project-based, you know, subsidies, they count. Uh, housing choice vouchers, you know, previously known as section eight, something that's tied to a person that can move from location A to B, they do not count uh, towards 10%, but public housing does. So as far as the census, we haven't updated the, the uh, 2020 numbers um, yet as far as its relationship to 40B. And the reason is, even though we do have the 2020 census redistricting data out that contains housing units, they have not removed uh, the seasonal uh, recreational use or occasional use housing units. So that's important to 40B because our whole system is based on year round housing units. If you look at the list online, um, you know the baseline denominator says year round housing units. It doesn't just say housing units. So we need to basically remove uh, all the seasonal units to get you an accurate count. We anticipate getting that data, excuse me, in May of 2023. Um, once we do have that data, uh, it's very likely that some of the communities that are above 10% now will fall below because basically anything that was constructed between 2010 and 2020 that qualifies as year round housing units, which is probably 98% of all the the units that were constructed uh, gets put into the denominator. So that will have a uh, inverse effect where, you know, if you're at 10.5%, 11%, you've built several hundred units, it's a pretty good chance you're gonna fall below. Uh, I get calls from developers every day asking when we're gonna release that. So they're looking at sites now in communities that are just above 10% to, to come in and pursue 40B. Um, alternatively, what's gonna happen is that housing production plan goals will increase. So if your goal now is, 17 units, uh, it could be 25 to get, a, to get a year moratorium. So that's something to keep an eye on. Oh, I'm sorry. So if you go on our website now, the most recent data we have is from December 21st, 2020. That's kind of referred to informally as the, as the public list. And I think that's just being posted in, in the, uh, the chat box. So that's something to take a look at. But as Ed mentioned, you know, as soon as we publish this list, it's almost um, obsolete the same day because it's a moving target. Units come off and on the SHI all the time. For instance, um, you know, building permits aren't issued in 12 months or occupancy permits aren't issued in 18 months, they could be removed. Uh, if the affordability restriction expires, you know, expiring use units, they can also be removed. Uh, right now, we're in the midst of doing what we call the biannual update. So that's when we go out to all 351 cities and towns and sort of say, okay, here's what we have on our list. By the way, we're missing building permits for this development. We need occupancy permits for that development. Um, and you can imagine in an ideal situation that's time consuming, uh, throw COVID on top of it, it's, it's kind of delayed us quite a bit. We're hoping to get that list out by the end of this calendar year. Uh, one thing to note, the MBTA Chapter 3A Multifamily Zoning Program is using the 2020 Congressional Redistricting Numbers. So we're going to have a seminar on that, I believe, on Thursday, the 29th. So those goals are already out there as far as, um, you know, how many total year, year round housing units there, there are. Now, if you do have a 40B that's coming down the pike and, you know, you're looking at the December 21st, 2020, 2020 uh, data, I suggest you contact us. Uh, Margo and Elaine are two attorneys in our office that are sort of the gatekeepers. Uh, they can also help with getting units on the SHI. You know, sometimes it's tricky, particularly with local action units or units uh, 
uh, constructed outside of the 40B process, 40R units to, to see when they count. Um, so those are the two contacts there. You can also contact me and or uh, Becker George to, to walk you through that process. Uh, but again, I think part of the reason the biannual update is taking so long is we have to go through virtually every unit that's on the SHI to make sure they still qualify. Uh, so the general land area minimum, again, this wasn't really used until uh, 2014, but it is, it is one of the original safe harbors. So it includes um, all districts zoned and unzoned areas in which any residential commercial or industrial use is permitted. It excludes land, except land, government land, sorry, except land owned by a local housing authority containing SHI eligible units. And uh, I should have said earlier, SHI is just an acronym for the subsidized housing inventory. That's the official name of the, the 40B list, but most people seem to call it the 10% list or the 40B list. Um, land area where all development is prohibited by DEP restrictive orders, but not other swamps, marshes, uh, marshes, marshes or wetlands. Uh, water bodies, obviously. Floodplain conservation open space zones where residential, commercial, or industrial use are completely prohibited. Uh, like all the safe harbors, we have the initial responsibility for determining you know, whether or not a community has hit the 1.5%. The burden of proof uh, rests with the ZBA. Um, in calculating the land area, uh, the ZBA can include information obtained from GIS maps and assessor maps. Uh, we've developed written guidance, and I have the link here, and we can also post this out either um, probably later uh, if people have access uh, with this link that sort of gives you guidance to walk you through the process. Um, I will say uh, it's not an easy thing to do. So if you're thinking of invoking the 1.5%, I would not wait until you have a comprehensive permit application in front of you and you've got 15 days to put this together. Uh, there's a lot of variables involved in this. Uh, one thing to note is uh, group homes count towards the one uh, towards uh, towards a, as an affordable unit. Now, when we talk about group homes, if you look at your community and say, you know, you've got 17 group homes, that doesn't mean you have 17 structures. That means you have 17 residents, uh, actually individuals uh, living in a group home, either via D DDS or DMH. Each one of those residents counts as an affordable unit. So we have a fairly, um, it's fairly complex, but we've, we've kind of worked it out where we have an agreement with DDS and DMH to um, calculate where you are on this acreage. And as soon as you get a PEL, you can request that information within 21 days. And then again, seven days after you, you receive the comp permit application, just to make sure you, you get the correct information. So we'll just say, you know, any town, your group home acreage is 3.8 acres. We don't have the information, the addresses in the house, uh, but we do have a process to get, get you that information. So unlike the SHI where Ed was mentioning, you know, and that the list, um, you know, we can say, you know, any town's at 5.7%, you're at 10.3%. If you call us and ask us, you know, where are we at the 1.5%, frankly, we don't know. Uh, there's too many changing variables. It's a very complex calculation. Uh, just to give you some, some background as to what's been going on with it, since 2014, we've had several communities invoke the 1.5%. Newton, four times. Stoneham, Norwood, uh, they did it twice. Milton, Watertown, Arlington, Braintree, and Medford, and most, re most recently, Oxford. In all those cases, with the exception of Watertown, DHCD, and then um, the HAC, everyone appealed to the HAC with the exception, I believe, of, of Milton. Um, uh, the finding was that the towns fell short of the 1.5. Some of them have come quite close, but they all have fallen short. Uh, right now, uh, there are three cases in front of the HAC. Oxford has one, Medford has two. Medford did have three, but one, one has dropped out recently. Um, to give you an idea of how complex these things are, if you want to go on to the DHC, the HAC web, web page, all the decisions for the 1.5s are there. Um, some of them are 25 to 35 pages. So there's, you know, I'm not saying don't invoke it, but it's something that's not, not easily uh, proved. And uh, we're trying to streamline it, but I think given the complexity, it's never going to be an easy process. It's not going to be like housing production plan certification or the, or the 10%. Uh, so as Ed mentioned earlier, uh, we've added some other safe harbors. These are things that are outside the statute because, you know, we've heard from communities sort of saying we're never going to get to 10 percent. 
Uh, the 1.5% is too complex, so we need something else to, to help us get some, some planning and um, sort of a breather from the 40B process. So if you submit a housing production plan under the regulations and guidelines and trying to cut things short so we, we stay on track, um, and you produce a certain percentage of housing, um, either a half of 1% or more, you have a one-year safe harbor. Now, if you produce 1%, you have a two-year safe harbor. Um, if the plans are good for five years, you have to do things like a housing analysis, you have to pick out, uh, pick out some uh, specific sites for 40B developments. Again, a uh, website has all the information there. All the plans are, are posted if you wanna look at a, a plan. Some communities do this in-house. Quite a few of the communities would do hire consultants because it's, it's just a lot to, uh, to take on. And it looks like the, the goals have been, um, been uploaded there in the chat. So you can see where the communities are. Uh, since 2003, we've had over 60 communities achieve safe harbor through, through certification and over 120 plans submitted. I just checked earlier today, we have 105 approved plans, which is, you know, I think a pretty impressive amount. There's 351 cities and towns. Uh, for a lot of the state, 40B is not an issue. They're either far over 40B or the market, you know, in Western Mass is not like it is in Eastern Mass. They don't really have a lot of 40B pressure out there, although you're starting to see it. Uh, and we have 18 plans currently certified. So they either have a one or a two year safe harbor. Other things to, to remember with housing production plans, it's sort of a narrow scope. Um, the units that count count during their initial year of eligibility. So if you have a plan approved today, but you, you uh, had a comp permit that was final three years ago, you wouldn't be able to count that now. It's really a plan sort of moving forward. Uh, and also the units must maintain uh, eligibility throughout the entire certification period. And this has been an issue um, if you come in as quickly as, uh, you know, I advise communities, if the ZBA approves the plan, you know, to, you know, on a Tuesday, come in Wednesday, once it's signed off by the clerk, because that's when the certification clock starts uh, ticking. It's not when we receive it. There's no um, sort of grace period for the 30 day review process. Just come in as quickly as you can. So at least you'll get a year, frankly, even if building permits don't get issued. Now we've had situations quite often. Uh, we have some activity at the HAC right now involving the town of Walpole, which I can't go into detail about because it's, it's pending. Um, we do suspend certification if say in month 15, the building permits aren't issued and they should have been issued in month 12 and then developers can come in and file. Now we do reinstate the original term of certification. Um, you know, so say month 16th, you, you do issue the building permits, you, you get the remainder of your original two-year safe harbor term. We wouldn't be able to start a new two-year clock, but at least you'd, you'd get that time in. So um, I know it's, it's difficult to get the building permits issued within 12 months, particularly if you're looking for public uh, financing of projects or you're going through GHD's one-stop process. But you know, as soon as you come in and think you've hit that production goal, um, come in for certification. So these are two other uh, safe harbors related application. Ed hit on this briefly, also known as the cooling off period. This was to stop developers coming in sort of saying, you know, if you don't give me uh, this marker rate proposal, we're gonna file a 40B next week. Um, they now at least have to wait 12 months to, to do that. Uh, now, if the original proposal was a special permit, let's say, and they had 10% um, or greater affordability component, they would not be subject to, to to this, this related application provision. Uh, so this has come up fairly often. Uh, recent progress, this is a, a safe harbor outside of HPP certification, say if a community uh, didn't have a housing production plan for whatever reason, and they were able to produce 2% of their total year on housing units uh, that qualified for the SHI, they would essentially get a year off. But in reality, you know, you're much better having a housing production plan because you, you'd get uh, a two-year safe harbor uh, for the production of 1% rather than 2%. So, you know, when you talk about these number, half of 1%, 1%, it doesn't sound like a lot, but if you have a, a fairly large community, these production numbers can be, be, be pretty large. We actually lowered them back in 2008. It used to be 0.75 and 1.5%. And, you know, some communities still think half a percent or 1% is, is too high. So I'm just gonna leave this on the screen for, for a bit. This applies to all the safe harbors. So if you think you're at 10%, the 1.5% um, 
you know, related application, whatever, whatever safe harbor, statutory things that added through, through the regulations, this is how the process works. And even if you're at, you know, 10 or 11%, you would still have to accept the 40B application. You can't just say, well, you know, we're at 10%, no thanks. Uh, you still have to follow this process. And uh, basically what happens is within 15 days at opening uh, the comprehensive, comprehensive public hearing, you provide written notice and a copy of the DHD describing which safe harbor you think you've achieved with all supporting documentation. We're still asking for hard copies, but uh, there's some, some guidance out there. Please email me the safe harbor uh, invocation because we are going to the office, but these timelines are pretty narrow. So everything is, is pretty much still being handled electronically, even though the state of emergency is over. The applicant then has 15 days to challenge uh, those materials. We have 30 days to uh, issue an initial uh, decision. Um, so if we say yes or no, either the, the ZBA or the applicant can file an interlocutory appeal to the HAC within 20 days of the DHD decision. Now, this is a decision just based, I'm talking about the hack, on, on the validity of the safe harbor. This is not the overall project, whether it's on an economic, they're just looking at the safe harbor. Um, if we don't act within 30 days of, of within our 30-day regulatory time frame, the decision uh, is automatically in favor of the ZBA. The procedure stops the requirement that, to terminate the, the comprehensive permit hearing within the 180 days. So essentially the, the clock is stopped. And this is my contact information. And I think I'm just gonna go ahead and I apologize for running through this. Happy to stay later. I'm gonna hand this over to Paul Haverty, who's uh, he was an attorney who's got an interesting case. Well, he's going to talk about an interesting case at the SJC, which could have quite a big impact on 40B. So I'm going to hand it off to Paul. Thanks. Thank you, Phil. Um, what I'm going to cover is, is not going to take as long as uh, Ed and Phil's presentations. It's a case um, that has recently been taken by the SJC sua sponte. It's Marenghi versus Six Forest Road, LLC. This involves the appeal of a comprehensive permit issued by the Salisbury Zoning Board of Appeals. Um, the Zoning Board of Appeals issued the comprehensive permit authorizing the construction of a 56 unit condominium development on a 27 acre parcel in Salisbury. Uh, oddly enough, the plaintiffs filed their appeal exactly one year ago today on September 15th, 2021. Um, and then on January 14th, 2021, before this appeal was filed, the legislator had enacted the so-called housing choice legislation, which included an amendment to General Laws Chapter 48, Section 17. So the revision to Chapter 48, Section 17 allows the trial court to impose a bond in the amount of up to $50,000 for appeals of special permits, variances, or site plans brought pursuant to General Laws Chapter 48, 17. The revised statute goes on to state that the bond may be imposed if the court finds that the harm to the defendant or to the public interest resulting from delays caused by the appeal outweighs the financial burden of the bond on the plaintiffs. So on March 2nd, 2022, the defendant filed a motion with the Superior Court requesting the bond be imposed. In full disclosure, my firm represents the defendant in this matter. Uh, on March 17th, 2022, the Superior Court allowed the motion for the bond in the amount of $35,000. On April 7th, 2022, the plaintiffs filed a petition with the single justice of the appeals court um, seeking to get that bond determination overturned. On May 11th, 2022, the single justice upheld the Superior Court decision. However, it allowed the plaintiffs to file an interlocutory appeal with the full appeals court. The plaintiffs filed their interlocutory appeal on May 19th, 2022. On July 28th, 2022, after the plaintiffs had filed their brief with the appeals court, but before the defendant had filed its reply brief, the SJC transferred the matter to its uh, own docket, sua sponte. Oral arguments on this matter will be heard on October 3rd, 2022, so within a couple of weeks. The major issue in dispute in this appeal is whether the bond provision that was inserted into General Laws Chapter 48, Section 17 is applicable to comprehensive permit appeals. The plaintiffs in this matter argue that the statute lists special permits, variances, and approvals of site plans as being subject to the bond provision. However, it does not specifically list comprehensive permits. 
The defendant argues that a butter appeals of comprehensive permit decisions are brought pursuant to General Laws Chapter 4817 as set forth in General Laws Chapter 40B, Section 21. The defendant also notes that Chapter 40B and its supporting regulations make it clear that a comprehensive permit subsumes all other local permits, which includes special permits, variances, and site plan approvals. Um, in particular, the regulations for Chapter 40B at 760 CMR 56 specifically note that site plans um, are part of what gets approved by a Board of Appeals. Um, the SJC actually solicited amicus briefs as part of this process in Chapter, along with 20 additional affordi affordable housing advocates have filed um, an amicus brief with the SJC. Um, those other housing advocates include DHCD, Mass Housing, and Mass Housing Partnership. Um, the brief that was submitted by CHAPA really addresses the legislative intent of the statute. And the CHAPA brief went into great detail, um, sort of laying out the intent of the revision of the statute, which was to increase the development of housing units in the Commonwealth with a particular emphasis on the increasing of affordable housing units in the Commonwealth. Um, and the CHAPA brief clearly ties the practice of frivolous appeals of Chapter 40B developments to the lack of housing in the Commonwealth. And this supports the argument that applying the bond requirements to the comprehensive permit uh, is clearly within the statutory intent of Chapter 4817. There are other issues that are part of the, the process, but there was a really sort of less pertinent. They go to the, the amount of the bond and, and what sort of costs are allowed um, to be factored into it, but those are really less of a, a 40B question than they really are uh, a, a interpretation of the new um, legislation statute. So that's all I have on the Marenghi case. So I'd like to turn back over to Felicia Jakes and I hope I got us back on track in terms of time. Thank you very much, uh, Ed, Phil and Paul. And yes, I think we are, um, we're pretty much on time. Uh, just a quick reminder, I know most of these documents are being posted in the chat and in the Q&A, but Chapel will also be sharing all of these resources that Ed, Phil, and Paul discussed on the event uh, webpage. We're now going to transition from 40B <clears throat> to additional tools communities can use to produce more affordable homes. For this panel, I will turn it over to Rieko Hayashi, Director of the Local Initiatives Program at DHCD. Rieko. Hello. Um, well, you've had a lot of very technical information from a number of 40B experts. Um, and the good news is our presentation is uh, fairly simple and uh, we'd like to go through it um, rather quickly so that we can get to our panelists. Um, so I am here um, with my colleague, Ali Sabatino. Um, I am the director of the LIP program and Ali is um, in charge of the local action unit program. Uh, Ali, could you advance the slide? Okay. Okay. So um, the local initiative program is a state program that encourages locally driven efforts to create affordable housing and it falls under the Chapter 40B statute and was created in response to opposition to 40B and the development of affordable housing projects. LIP provides a mechanism to encourage locally supported affordable housing where the municipality is engaged in the development of the project prior to any application to DHCD. So there are two type of LIP projects. Um, one projects, one which we call LIP 40B projects. And so obviously there is a comprehensive permit required. Um, and the other type that you may be less familiar with um, are called local action units. 
So as I said, with 40B projects, um, there is a comprehensive permit um, that the developer is seeking to obtain. Um, and the municipality must support the application. With the local action unit projects, um, generally these are projects where the municipality um, brings the application forward to us and they are taking some type of municipal action such as a uh, special permit or a zoning variance that requires an affordable housing component to that. So since um, its inception in the 80s, we have approved approximately 40,000 units of housing, um, of which about 8,000 of the units are affordable. So these are units which have not received any type of subsidy. Um, in 2021, uh, we approved 6, 000, about 6,000 units. And in 2020, it was about 4,730 units. Of those units, 5,769 5, were local action units and 1,962 were LIP 40B units, of which uh, about 1,356 were affordable. So Ali is the much busier person <laughs> in our LIP program because she handles the LAU side and I handle the, the 40B side. Um, so these are projects that are developed across the state. Why is LIP appealing to housing partners? Um, well, eligible units will count on the subsidized housing inventory. These are locally endorsed projects where the community has a say in the early stages. It's a non-competitive process and it's fairly simple. And as I said, there's no state subsidy um, which is involved. Um, the comprehensive permit is a good vehicle for consolidating waivers. Some of the requirements include that the market and affordable home ownership units must be indistinguishable from the exterior. The affordable units must be distributed proportionately throughout the development. The amenities must be made available to all residents and at least 10% of the total units in a family development must be three bedroom and be distributed proportionately throughout the project, both by location and income tier. So the subsidized housing inventory has been mentioned several times, so I think you have an idea of what that is, but um, just want to reaffirm that these units do count on the subsidized housing inventory if, um, you know, uh, they developed under an eligible state or federal subsidy program of which LIP would count. Um, they are affordable to households at or below 80% of area median income. They have a long-term use restriction and are subject to an affirmative fair housing marketing and resident selection plan. And as I think we're just reiterating what has been said previously, but if it's rental, at least 20% of the units are at 80% or below, or at least 20% are at 50% or below, then all the units count. And this applies to both the 40B as well as the LAU side. Um, and if it's ownership, only the affordable units would count on the SHI. So now I'm just going to go over the LIP 40B application process, which is slightly different with LIP um, than with some other agencies. Um, so the requirements are, if you've never done a 40B project, it's a good idea to contact me to kind of go over what the requirements are. Um, of course, there's an application that, again, has to be signed off by the municipality um, along with the application fee. It is then returned to the municipality for a 30 day review or comment period. There is a, an appraisal that is required that we commission. Um, and then we have to do a site visit with the sponsor and the local officials. And once the appraisal is completed, then we issue a project eligibility to obtain a comprehensive permit. So, at that point, you, the, you, we issued the PAL or the project eligibility to the CBA for the comprehensive permit. 
Once that is issued, we have to approve the permanent fair housing marketing plan and the regulatory agreement, which is that uh, long-term use restriction. And with that, um, we issue final approval. And now I'm gonna hand it over to Allie, who's gonna talk about local action units. Thank you so much, Riego. Um, so the local action unit process, as the title states, is really locally driven. And you can see this in the requirements that I'm going to go through um, in a moment. So the first one is the application must be submitted by the municipality. Again, just driving home that local action unit. It's locally driven. Um, and if anyone in the audience has submitted um, one of these applications before, you might notice we tweaked the application just a little bit uh, to add some uh, question about green sustainability um, initiatives that are potentially in, this, in the development, uh, the local action developments. So you might notice that if, you, if you've submitted before that change. Uh, you have to submit evidence of local action. So what does that mean? Um, if a town or a city has inclusionary zoning um, and a developer has to get a special permit uh, to enact that, that requires um, a certain percentage of your development to be affordable housing, that special permit would be an evidence of a local action. Another example is if um, a municipality buys a piece of property and creates affordable housing on that property through CPA funds um, and town meeting action, that would be another example of a local action. Another key requirement uh, that's needed is the affirmative marketing plan and lottery. And I'll go through this in much more detail um, in the next couple of slides. And then again, the regulatory agreement, which has been Rieko mentioned and has been mentioned before, that's the long-term restriction. Um, that means that these units will be affordable in perpetuity. Okay, uh, so we do have an obligation to affirmatively further fair housing. So what does that mean? Um, we must allow maximum opportunities for persons protected under fair housing laws. And how we do that is through the marketing, application process, and selection uh, policies and procedures that we enact. And again, that's done specifically through the marketing plan, which I had mentioned is a key requirement for the local action unit application. So some of these, um, the contents of this marketing plan is a description of marketing and outreach. So that's where are you going to market uh, this application for these units? How are you going to outreach to the community? We require samples of ads and publications uh, that you're going to put out there. Um, we also require in this plan what kind of app, um, application and informational materials are going to need to be submitted by the applicants. Um, we also require in this plan eligibility requirements. Um, so that really means what is this income eligible? Will people um, qualify that in that way? And then we also require in this plan lottery and a resident selection procedure. So how are you going to conduct your lottery and how are you going to select your future residents? And then if there's a local preference, uh, you have to include a clear description of the preference used. And again, and I think this was mentioned by Ed before, um, these, are, these plans are done by specialists. So we've just put together a slide about some examples of LIP projects. There's just a wide range all across the state. But here are some pictures of just a few examples. Um, you know, we see LIP projects through new construction, building conversion, rehab, there's large and small rental projects, home ownership, first time home buyers, buy down programs, and nonprofit. And again, this is just a small snapshot um, of the different types of LIP projects that come in. But again, um, they're mostly locally driven. And this is our contact information. Um, I know that we, Rieko and I breezed through um, these two processes rather quickly. And if we can't get to every question in the chat, we would be happy if you do have a question or you think about one later after um, you're marinating on our presentation, we would be happy um, if you wanted to email or give us a call, we'd be happy to answer any questions that we had, ha that you have. 
Um, we've also added Margo LeClaire, who's DHD's counsel, and I believe that Phil um, had mentioned this too. She oversees the subsidized housing inventory, um, and this is her contact information. We've also included uh, just a few um, web uh, links to a web page, um, the DHDD web page that we think could be helpful uh, as you're going through these two application processes. So the first one is to the website DHCD's website for the local initiative program, and you can just Google these um, if you know you don't have them on the slide. Um, but there's the application uh, through this link for both the 40B. Um, LIP 40B and also the LAU application. And then the second one is also the DHCD's web page for the subsidized housing inventory. So with that, I'm going to hand it back to Rieko. Thank you, Ali. Um, so I'm very excited to introduce our two panelists. Um, these are two people that I've worked with on both local action unit projects as well as LIP 40Bs. Um, the first uh, panelist is Amanda Chincola, who is the deputy director of how I'm sorry, the deputy director of planning and development for the city of Salem. Um, and Salem really came to our attention um, a couple of years ago because we suddenly had ten applications from them, and um, their um, the number of LIP and LAU projects has really grown exponentially. Um, and then the other speaker that we have um, who will tell you a little bit more about the, their uh, firsthand experience with the 40B process is uh, Clay Williams, who works for um, Eastland Partners. And um, he has been, he is in charge of permitting and acquisitions um, as well as being the project manager there. And um, he has had a lot of success in permitting um, both ownership and rental projects. So I think I'm gonna have um, Amanda start um, and um, kind of give an overview of what they've been doing in Salem in terms of LIP. Thank you. Um, so Salem's been working really hard on creating affordable housing. And one of the tools, as Rico mentioned, that we use very often is this local action unit program. And I love this program. I really like it because it's a way to create affordable housing with no public subsidy. Um, so this is done within market rate development. It's a fairly easy program for municipal staff to implement. Um, and as all the other speakers had mentioned, it is a way to increase your subsidized housing inventory percentage. Um, but the real reason we do this is it creates our much needed deed restricted affordable housing. So I'm going to share my screen and just breeze through a couple of slides here. So this is how Salem implements our local action unit program. It starts really early on in the development process. Essentially, as soon as staff, it comes to our attention that a project is being considered, we'll ask that development team will reach out and ask them to attend a pre-application meeting with city staff. Uh, and we invite a whole bunch of staff members to this. We include the fire department, engineering, CONCOM if that's applicable, um, because we want to give this developer uh, a feel for all the requirements in the city and the expectations. And so it's a good opportunity for the developer. And at that time, we take that opportunity to also let the developer know what Salem's values are and what our expectations are. And affordable housing is one of those important values in Salem. And it's an expectation that 10% of housing units in new development be affordable and um, eligible for the subsidized housing inventory, hence they are local action units. And um, we require that the units be affordable at 60% of the area median income. Now that 60% AMI is fairly new. Uh, we started implementing that deeper level of affordability about a year ago. And we got to that number by studying our housing needs. Um, we looked at household incomes in Salem. We had many, many, many communications and discussions with the community. And we studied what the market can feasibly support. And that's critical because the last thing we want to do is cycle development. Um, we actually found that 
with one of our former projects, the 80% market rents were more expensive than our uh, 80% max rents were more expensive than our market rents. And so that was pretty eye-opening as well to show that the delta is not that large with the 60% AMI. That's super specific to Salem. So you need to look at what your own housing needs are and what your household incomes are to see what can be supported. Um, but here we found that 60% is financially feasible. So 10% doesn't sound like a lot, right? It's only 10% of development. And in Salem, a typical development is usually about 20 units. So we're talking two units a project. But since about, this was about 2012, like 2010, we've had 602 new affordable units here in Salem. And this is the little pie chart. I'll go through these acronyms super quick, quickly. Um, but what you'll see is this mustard color here is the local action units, 102 local action units created in about a decade with no public subsidy. And that's a pretty significant portion of the pie. I'm really happy about that. Again, not only are we increasing the percentage on our subsidized housing inventory, we're adding more much needed housing to our community. So this chart just goes over some of those other acronyms, which I'm gonna just breeze through. But the key takeaway here is that there are a whole bunch of different ways to create affordable housing. So don't just work on one, Look at all the different ways that you can create it. Um, the first three rows here are what us planners refer to as capital A affordable housing. And that's because they're deed restricted, they're on our subsidized housing inventory. Um, that includes the local implementation units or friendly 40Bs um, that Clay is going to dive into in more detail in a bit. And then of course my favorite local action units, I included the LIHTC or LIHTC, um, that stands for Low Income Housing Tax Credit Units. Um, really, um, all our Friendly 40B projects we've had have been financed with LIHTC. Um, I just separated it out here so you can see LIP on this chart means it was permitted with a Friendly 40B, and LIHTC means it was permitted with a special permit, but also happened to be financed with. Um, low-income housing tax credits. And usually we see our nonprofit partners creating those units. I also included accessory dwelling units on the list as in that gray section. I know it's a really small number and we consider these lowercase a affordable because they're not on the subsidized housing inventory, but they're a super important component of our housing stock. So again, don't just look at one type of affordable housing they all matter, they're all important. So again, I just wanna go through 130 units have been built to date, 83 more are under construction, 93 of the total are permitted, another 296 are currently being reviewed by our land use boards and almost ready for um, approvals. So I guess my best practices that I wanna share with you is just communicate your community's values early on and set those expectations early on, whatever those values and expectations are. Um, again, I say it again in Salem, affordable housing is a value here in our planning documents. We consistently refer to housing as a human right. And that's something that we expect private development to contribute to in some way. And that's that 10% of units at 60% very median income. And we we really lean on these plans. Um, I know a lot of communities here like Salem work on plans for their communities. This is just an example of a few. We have housing needs assessment. We're actually almost have a housing production plan um, with J.M. Goldson who assisted with that. We have this uh, resiliency plan that we worked on with Beverly. We're an age-friendly community. Uh, we have a preservation plan. And these are the values that we communicate to the developers during those pre-applications. And that's something that you can do early on. Just make sure you set those expectations so it's not a surprise at the end. So that was my very high level overview of how Salem implements local action units. This is my contact information um, and I'm gonna turn it over to Clay 
to go through the developer's perspective of the LIP program. Wonderful. Thank you, Amanda. Let me share my screen here. Um, up here. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Clay Williams, a representative from Eastland Partners working in permitting and acquisitions. Um, a big thank you to Rieko for inviting me to participate as a panelist today. Uh, very excited about this. So when I was considering the name of the conference, Tools and Strategies for Increasing Housing Production, uh, originally I went a little technical. There's this great pro forma that I use that will make your construction draw schedule and um, spit out these amazing PDFs for construction financing. Um, but, you know, as I was thinking a little bit more deeply um, just about housing production, my uh, involvement with real estate development started back in college. I ended up getting my degree in urban planning and sustainable development from the Western, from the University of Western Washington. Um, so even though I've got my developer hat on, uh, I approach all of our projects from a planning background. That's what I was trained in. Um, so my presentation is called Back to Basics for the Local Initiative Program. Be diligent, be open, and be honest. So in terms of being diligent, everyone says do your due diligence. Um, for us at Eastland Partners, that starts with site selection. And uh, we have found for our um, successful LIP projects to try and find parcels of land that have either, you know, back land that wouldn't necessarily be developed, some sort of public asset um, that we can just write off right at the beginning and say, you know, hello town, we have uh, for the top here on Pleasant Street in Grafton, we had a 12 acre parcel. We were only gonna develop the front six acres and we will be gifting the back land to either the Grafton Land Trust or the Conservation Commission. Um, there is a number of pre-existing walking trails back there and it's surrounded by other publicly owned open space. So that was, you know, a great public asset that we were able to provide um, as part of our LIP discussions. Another thing to be diligent about is local needs. You know, as so many others have talked about today, the housing production plan um, really serves as a incredibly helpful roadmap to proposing a development project in a town. I mean, it goes so far as to list the type of units uh, the town is looking for, certain affordability thresholds, and even, you know, what sort of um, quantity they're looking for. So for Grafton, um, which both of these projects are in, they had a large need for uh, rental apartment housing. Most all of the development in that town over the past 20-ish uh, years has been kind of the large lot single family projects. So, you know, we read that in the housing production plan during our due diligence and site planning process. We said, hey, these would be, you know, great spots for some three-story walk-up apartment buildings. Um, and presented that to the select board. Um, as others have talked about as well, I think something to be diligent about is public health and public safety. I think these can be kind of some of the, you know, smoking guns that maybe stand in front of a way of a 40B if you have, you know, issues with water and wastewater or maybe, you know, safety. I think if you find a site that has some of those aspects associated with it, it might be better just to kind of avoid that one and see if you can find another piece of land. Um, just to make sure that your project is as effective as possible. Uh, so the, the second part um, is being open. I think from my perspective, the you know, local initiative program or friendly 40B um, is really a way to garner more uh, public input. I think that with the traditional 40B path, you get your project eligibility letter, you submit to the ZBA, and then everybody is kind of a little tense saying, hey, you know, we only have 180 days to make a decision on this and people feel kind of rushed and a little nervous. And with the local initiative program, there's no timeline associated. So for my experience over four different projects, it usually takes between four to six months of meeting with the board of selectmen. Um, it's really important to make sure that people feel heard, um, you know, engage in active listening, uh, take good notes when you're at the meetings. Um, something that I uh, typically do is provide uh, memorandums that's shown on the slide here, which basically, you know, for example, the first paragraph, you know, we heard some concerns about traffic, 
um, access and roadway safety and, you know, put forth some of the mitigation items we could see as being effective, like some of those flashing uh, speed limit signs, just as a way to, you know, make sure that your abutters and your board members um, input is considered um, and talked about. The other part with uh, the LIP program is negotiation. I think there is a bit of kind of give and get um, that goes along with it. So we typically ask either the town administrator or the select board themselves for some sort of wish list. Uh, Eastland Partners has their own excavation company. So uh, one example of a wish list item, we recently got a comprehensive permit for the reserve in Auburn, which was 324 units. And as part of the LIP negotiations, we um, committed to installing 3,000 feet of a water main project to connect the town of Auburn to the Worcester water system, since it was identified in their um, municipal vulnerability preparedness plan um, as you know, one of their uh, top items for increasing resiliency. Um, and I think the other thing too is to, you know, as Ed had said before, to be flexible with your project. I think I would expect things to change. You know, I think some people, when you're in the project planning process, take the opinion that, you know, my site plan is designed, I have construction bids and financing in place. I think that with uh, the LIP process, you wanna be discussing these projects from kind of a 30,000 foot overview. Are they good or bad for the town? And I think being able to incorporate feedback from municipal boards and from, um, you know, abutters will really increase the effectiveness of your proposal. Um, and the last thing is uh, cooperation. I think you, this picture here was a sidewalk that we hosted for that 59 Pleasant Street project in Grafton. Um, it's very beneficial to go over and above. You know, we reached out to our neighbors outside of the select board and held um, accessory meetings where people could show up you know, voice their concerns, ask questions. And then again, we use the memorandum format to provide their questions and our responses um, to the select board. And I think that really helped, um, you know, kind of turn some people's opinion on the project and just make sure that everybody is kind of on the same page moving forward. Uh, you know, the last one kind of goes without saying, um, I think being honest is incredibly important for friendly 40Bs. Um, a big part of what I do is municipal impact analysis. So I have a presentation that I deliver to select boards, which goes through, you know, the typical main impacts that come with new housing development, school age children, uh, strain on municipal services. Um, and we usually try and uh, execute a traffic study beforehand. Um, it's really important to collect as much data as possible. That way you have the information to support the claims that you're making. Because in all honesty, people are gonna show up to the meetings and say, oh, you know, the sewer system can't support this or our schools are already overcrowded. But when you have the um, data behind you to say, I understand why you, you know, would think that way, but when you actually look at it, you know, those just don't end up being true all the time. Um, limiting bias is also really important. You know, I, I found tons of different studies that were sponsored by some of the larger, um, you know, development firms that say, yeah, you know, housing is great. We can build a million and everybody will, you know, skip away into the sunset. The information that I provide is from data companies. All they specialize in is providing data. They don't have a vested interest in producing housing. And I think for myself as well, you know, it's helpful. I get up there in front of the select board and say, you know, I am a for-profit developer, you know, working in housing production. This is what I do for a living, just so everybody is on the same page about, you know, where we're coming from. Uh, the last part about being honest is relying on professionals. Um, you know, I have a great understanding of zoning and site planning, but when it comes to traffic engineering, you know, other than, you know, reading some trip generation numbers, uh, that's really kind of the end of my limits of what I understand. So, you know, bring in your professionals, bring in your uh, traffic engineers, your, um, you know, site civil contractors to talk about stormwater and drainage. And just understanding your limits, um, I think, is incredibly effective. And another thing to be honest about, too, is that not everybody is going to like your project. I think coming into it with that mindset um, will also increase your effectiveness. 
you know, I had somebody write a letter to the town of Grafton that called me a, uh, a hawk descending on weak town boards with inflated information. And uh, the best part about America is we're all entitled to our own opinions. Um, but being able to have the data and, you know, the professional support to kind of combat some of those claims, I think will make your project uh, much more effective. So when I say municipal impacts, um, what are they and how are they measured? Um, I measure them with objective data within this presentation. Some of them are easier to understand than others. Um, there are you know, established demographic multipliers, which could project how many school-aged children or how many um, residents in general would move in per unit. Um, other things like you know, per household cost method of strain on police and fire infrastructure is you know, a bit harder to understand. I think often municipal impacts are only talked about in a negative fashion and fiscally. You know, like I said before, increases in school children, traffic and congestion, and strain on municipal services like um, police and fire. And having the data to be able to say, you know, with X amount of units of housing, we anticipate, you know, Y costs that are offset by Z revenues, which for us has been incredibly effective and in, gaining initial approvals for almost 700 units of housing over four towns in central Massachusetts uh, through the LIP program working with RIECO. Um, I think that the local initiative program is a great way for a you know, flexible developer to kind of increase the effectiveness and also simplify permitting. One of the other important things is uh, the power of visuals. Um, I've seen other developers show up to you know, an initial uh, lip program or lip project presentation with just an 11 by 17 site plan and you know having renderings uh, working with architects to be able to show people you know how these buildings actually look i usually have my architect render in a, uh, a budding house or two that way people can kind of see the scale of things um, and he specifically works with this program called lumion pro which produces these fantastic renderings um, you'll see in a minute here as we kind of start flying into the community. I mean, you can see the reflection of the clouds and car windows and things. And having a tool like this, um, which is basically built with a CAD drawing of contours and some elevations of buildings, really helps the town and your neighbors um, understand what the project looks like. You know, where is this apartment building in relation to my house? How much taller is it? Um, you know, that sort of thing. And, you know, we use these in Grafton along with some of the other techniques that I talked about. And we ended up, um, the town actually ended up in Safe Harbor, I think after our second select board meeting uh, through working with Phil over at DHDD. And with my presentation and providing all this information, we secured both endorsements um, right after the town had um, secured their Safe Harbor status. So they could have just said, no, we don't wanna support this. We don't need to. You know, we know that the ZBA doesn't have to um, approve these projects, but it ended up being super effective. They're great tools um, and they just, they look really cool. Um, I think here, um, here's my contact information. Uh, I, I know that this um, conference is a little more uh, planning focused, but if there are any developers um, in the room who would like to get maybe one of these renderings done for your project, or talk about a municipal impact analysis study. You can find me on LinkedIn uh, under Clayton Williams. There's my email address and my cell phone number. Um, just wanna say thank you again to Rieko for inviting me to present today. Um, I think a lot of these tools and strategies that we've talked about will make a measurable difference in housing affordability in Massachusetts. I'm optimistic that things are getting better even though the market conditions are a little crazy right now. I think that through supply and demand and producing more housing, um, it will become, you know, more affordable for everybody. So uh, that concludes my presentation. Um, I guess at this point, we are going to move to the Q&A. Is that right, Carol? I think that's where we left off. And um, if Rieko um, wanted to lead us off, that would be great. We've got... Sure. Yeah, um, thank you for your... Fantastic presentations. Um, and let's see. Um, okay, I only see 
I don't know if it's just my screen, but I don't I don't see any questions. Am I not looking in the right place or it should be in the Q&A, right? Yeah, um, I just wanted to point out we've had a little bit of a problem with our Q&A and we apologize to everybody um, because it's not working as, um, as we had hoped it would. We had asked mm -hmm. people to um, post in the chat. So Rieko, check the chat. Okay. Um, everybody's okay. been fielding questions. So um, right. we are trying to repost for everyone. Um, okay. So you All might right. check there. Um, Rico, I think it's just someone had asked about um, does 40 be required that the affordable units be affordable in perpetuity or for a limited amount of time? And I think there was the question was answered that they are they do have to be affordable in perpetuity. Um, and let's see. Um, uh, the question is, what happens if the project gets built and then the developer decides not to include the affordable units? Um, well, he would be in violation of the permit. Um, oops. I don't know if anyone has had experience with a situation like that, but. Um. Diego, in, in Salem, um, for some of our smaller developers, when we were first starting with our local action unit program, mm -hmm. um, they would accept a condition to have 10% of their units affordable, but then they completely know what that meant. And then yeah. when we started going through the process, they were ready for the certificate of occupancies and they hadn't gone through the process yet. And so oh. we said, no, 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 we're not signing off on any certificate of occupancies until you go through the process. And I think that's an important takeaway to learn is yeah. before you, once you are ready to sign off on that building permit, make mm -hmm. sure the development team knows, you know, hire a lottery agent. You need to work with these specialists to work on your affirmatively fair, um, furthering fair housing marketing plan. 40B mm -hmm. projects, they have the affordable housing expertise arm. The local action yeah. units usually need more help from the municipality. Right, exactly. Because when the 40B units, they can't just sell the, the market rate units and then kind of leave the affordable units as an afterthought. Um, there has to be, they have to also be selling the affordable units at the same time. Um, okay. Uh, Somebody else, Riego, asked if uh, affordability mm -hmm. thresholds are the same for ownership projects and for uh, rental projects. That was an interesting question. Yes. Um, so in order for units to qualify for the SHI, um, they have to be at or below 80 percent. Um, so, you know, as Amanda said, um, in Salem, they're looking for greater affordability. Um, but in order to be SHI eligible, they have to be at or below 80%. Um, one, um, kind of quirky thing, uh, with LIP is that with the ownership projects, um, we actually set the price at 70% of AMI but the affordability is at 80, whereas with rental, it's 80. Riego, I think there is another question that I'm not sure has been answered yet. Uh, so okay. we mentioned in our presentation uh, that LIPS do not require any state subsidy. Uh, mm -hmm. And the question is, doesn't that, doesn't LATEC uh, count? Don't they typically want to reap the benefits of LATEC? Mm -hmm. Um, 
that may be true, but it's a very competitive process. Um, and not every project, you know, can obtain the tax credits. So, um, I think, you know, I mean, it, it is, it is when they can't get a subsidy, um, and they need to qualify in, for some, in some other way, um, that they often will come to, to live. Rico, there's a few more being added to the oh, chat. Okay. Uh, yeah. Okay. So I don't know if what I said was clear. Um, so, you know, for example, in a lip rental project, um, the affordable rentals have to be set at 30% of 80% as per the regulatory agreement, the restriction. Um, and that is a condition of approval. Um, so, um, you know, tenants can have a subsidy of their own, but there is no subsidy actually attached to the property. Um, this is privately developed housing um, with units that are set at a lower rent, um, but there is no subsidy attached to the development. Uh, one thing, you know, just to, if I may add, Rico, somebody asked, you know, in a similar question, I don't understand how affordable units can be created without subsidy and mm -hmm. still not have tenants pay more than 30% of income. Mm -hmm. And, you know, my answer to this uh, mm -hmm. would be that the 40B program, you know, although it does not necessarily have a financial subsidy, mm -hmm. the comprehensive permit and increased density allow us as developers to provide you know, excess mm -hmm. units at mm -hmm. lower rates. You know, for mm -hmm. the reserve project, I think our buy right plan was 40 single family houses. Mm -hmm. And we ended up getting a comprehensive permit for 324 apartments. So even so though we don't have, you know, a check coming from the state, yeah, being able to increase density and provide more market rate housing allows mm -hmm. us to, you know, have a certain number of units at that lower income rate. Yeah, and I would say that for LAU, um, it's even, it may be even more financially feasible because, you know, when only 10% um, of the project are, I think we just received an application where there are 500 units and of that eight are affordable. So clearly, <laughs> um, you know, it's not a hardship to create affordability for those eight units. And I think also too, um, one of the things that we did in our Grafton projects um, through discussions with the Affordable Housing Trust, we mm -hmm. actually expanded our scope of affordability. So mm -hmm. instead of providing 25% of our total units at 80% median income, mm -hmm. we mm -hmm. provided 15% of the total at 80%, 5% mm -hmm. at 60% AMI and 5% mm -hmm. at 50% AMI mm -hmm. as well. And mm -hmm. I was honestly surprised when I was using the one stop pro forma, it really did not have, you know, that mm -hmm. drastic of an impact on our debt service coverage ratio and mm -hmm. just the overall profitability of the project. Wow, that's good. That was, you know, important to add. Yeah. Okay. Um, Okay, as to the question with skyrocketing rents, do the 40 being non affordable units have to follow the HUD FMRs? So the non for so the market, I assume that means the market rate units. Um, That's my understanding. Yeah, I mean, that the market rate units don't have anything to do with. HUD FMR, I mean that their market their market rents. Um, and the LIP units actually um, are based on the um, HUD area median income limits, not the fair market rents. Um, the calculation is 30% of 80% of area median income. Um, the formula is slightly different for um, 
mass housing and mass housing partnership than for LIP. Um, it's based on the number of bedrooms plus one, and it's 30% of 80% of that. Probably have time for one more question, I think. Do you need some help, Rieko, pulling it up? Okay. Um, Here's a here's one. Did you see the last one uh, from Polita Deegan? Does the amount of subsidy impact SHI eligibility? For example, we're working with a town with $175,000 subsidy toward a buy down unit. Due to the market demands in the town, they're wondering if they can increase to a $200,000 subsidy. The subsidy won't have any impact on the SHI eligibility because. Um, the price is going to be the affordable price. That's the price that's going to be the price that's marketed and the price that's in the deed restriction. So, um, you know, it, um, it, it definitely doesn't impact the SHI eligibility because we're using the affordable price, not, not the market rate price. Got it. Thank you. Um, with that, we are going to have to wrap up, even though I know there's always a lot more questions. Um, I'm Rachel Heller, the CEO at CHAPA. I just want to first thank our panelists. Um, thank you. Sorry. Hold on. Elise. My daughter is uh, homesick. <laughs> uh, thank you so much, Riego, Ali, Clay, and Amanda, you know, laying out the framework for Local the local initiative program and showing us examples and experiences you have had is inspirational and just provides us with a little bit more know-how of how to do this in our own communities. So I just wanna thank you for that. I wanna thank everybody for joining today um, and to make sure that you know you are invited to our session next week. Uh, as you know, we're doing three sessions over three weeks. And next week, the title of the session is Affordable Housing is a Team Sport building partnerships to reach your housing goals. This session will feature two conversations with municipal staff and advocacy organizations describing how they work together to achieve great results in their communities. Uh, spoiler alert, the communities that we'll hear from are Revere and Lynn in part one and Essex and Franklin County communities in part two. So really getting a sense of how this works in different types of communities. It's great that there are so many different communities working on these issues, and, and I think there's a lot to learn from all of them. Um, so I just want to thank you all for joining today, and I look forward to seeing you next Thursday, September 22nd at 3 o'clock. Same bat time, same bat channel. Have a great day. <laughs>